Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ here in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm glad you're with us for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We're working our way through the book of Exodus and tonight we come to Exodus chapter 21. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 21. We'll be there in just a moment. And if you have any questions, any concerns about tonight's class, if you have something we need to be praying about for our members, if you have something that needs to be updated in this coming Lord's Day's bulletin, let me know. Uh, we would invite you to get in touch, but send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. We would love to hear from you. Well, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So God's people have left the nation of Egypt. They are free from slavery. This journey from freedom, as we have on our uh, opening our title slide here. Now they've traveled three months into the wilderness and they are assembled together at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses has received the Ten Commandments up there on the mountain and tonight we pick up with the start of a long series of additional commandments. I think that would be one way of summarizing this. Uh, last week we noted that the Ten Commandments written on tablets of stone were something of a table of contents concerning what was coming next, summarizing some of the more important aspects of God's law, and perhaps arranged under two possible headings. If you remember our discussion last week, uh, number one, how the people were to love God, and then how the people were to love each other. If you remember, Jesus was once asked, what was the greatest commandment? And according to Jesus, of course, the greatest commandment is that we love God, and the second was that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we aren't given that division uh, exactly in those words in the Ten Commandments themselves, but it certainly seems as if uh, the first four describe how to love God, and then the next six describe how to love one another, or at least how to behave toward one another. So uh, those big points of the law uh, seem to be summarized in the Ten Commandments. So tonight then, God starts filling in some of those details, if we want to put it in those terms. So let's jump right into it tonight with the first paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 21, and let's look at verses 1 through 6. Exodus chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Now these are the ordinances which you are to set before them. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years. But on the seventh he shall go out as a free man without payment. If he comes alone, he shall go out alone. If he is the husband of a wife, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall belong to her master, and he shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out as a free man, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently." I'm pretty sure this is at least somewhat familiar to us. You know that we sing a song about this, don't we? We have a song that references this provision in God's law. And we'll get back to that in just a few moments. But for now, as we get into some of the details of the law, let's realize from the beginning here that the law was never really perfect from the beginning. And I say this because of what we read over in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. And the law of Moses was not faultless, not because God failed in some way in giving the law, but because the people had some issues, didn't they? Uh, one way of looking at this is that the law never really presented God's ideal vision of his people, but the law regulated human weakness. Uh, it came to them as they were. It regulated human stubbornness, we might say. Now, obviously, we think of what Jesus said in Matthew 19 uh, concerning marriage and divorce, and there were certain things that God allowed under the law of Moses that he allowed, not because it was an ideal situation, but he tolerated some things because of their hardness of heart. Well, of course, today God is not as lenient as he was back then. We read uh, Paul's sermon on the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17. There were times of ignorance that God overlooked in times past, uh, but now he calls all people everywhere to repent. And in my opinion, we see this with slavery, starting here in this opening paragraph. What a way to jump into this. Uh, slavery obviously is not ideal to say the least, and yet we find in the law of Moses that God regulated it, as I understand it, simply to maintain some sense of law and order, some sense of justice, and to get his people through the wilderness from one end to the other uh, to the promised land, and eventually to bring the Messiah into the world. 
So we go into this section with the understanding that the people would own slaves. God never commanded them really to own slaves, but they are going to do it. And so these are some things to keep in mind to maintain at least some sense of law and order and justice. I would think of this almost like God's uh, regulations concerning the king. God did not want them to have a king. They demanded a king. And so we had some rules for the king someday. And that's kind of similar to what we have here. So notice, first of all, how we have a reference to buying or purchasing a Hebrew slave. So I want us to notice from this that these people are not capturing, they are not kidnapping these people from some far off land as happened in the early years here in the United States. But here, this is more of a financial transaction among their own people. These are Hebrews purchasing Hebrews. And again, not that it's perfect, but we might even compare it to the idea of indentured servitude that we do also have in our own history here in the United States, where people would get into debt, they would actually sell themselves as servants for a certain length of time. So legislating into that particular culture, we notice here God establishes this ordinance that slavery was only to last for six years. So he puts a limit on it. There is an end to this. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And so this slavery, although allowed, is to be very limited in its time. Well, after those six years, the slave was allowed to go free. That was God's law. But then notice that we have some options, and it starts getting complicated in a hurry because people are complicated. So here, if the slave has a wife and kids of his own, they can go too. However, if his master has given him a wife, well, the wife and the kids have to stay. And I'm assuming that the wife could then leave at the end of her own six years. There would be that delay there where their servitude may not match up in time sequence, although we're not exactly specifically told that here. So this man can leave with his own wife and kids. That's option one. He can leave on his own alone if his wife belongs to the master. Or notice the third option here is that if the man loves his master, if he loves his wife and his kids, if he's unwilling to wait, then he can willingly decide to stay behind and stay beyond those six years. Well, if the man decides to stay willingly beyond those six years, the master is to take his slave to the Lord he is to bring him to the doorpost of the house, and the master is to pierce the slave's ear with an awl as a sign that he is willingly becoming a slave to his master on a permanent basis. And there were some benefits to this arrangement. At this point, it almost becomes more like an employer-employee relationship. And I know it's not a perfect comparison, not a perfect analogy, but that decision is somewhat voluntary. I know we've got the wife and kids involved here, so not exactly but it is something of a choice for the man. Now, the song part of this is when we sing to God, when we apply this to ourselves figuratively. Pierce my ear, O Lord my God. Take me to your door this day. I will serve no other gods. Lord, I'm here to stay. For you have paid the price for me. With your blood you ransom me. I will serve eternally. Free I'll never be. And I will admit this is not the way this passage in Exodus was originally intended. It was not intended to apply to us and our relationship with God. However, I think we'll agree that it is an interesting picture, isn't it, of our relationship with God. We are his slaves in a sense, but we serve willingly. We serve voluntarily. We signed up for this. Uh, he owns us and we agree with that and we serve him voluntarily and we choose to belong to God eternally. By the way, if you are wondering what an awl is, A-W-L, it is basically a sharpened screwdriver. And I, I meant to take one down here in my home study with me uh, this afternoon as I'm recording. I, I failed to do that. I've got uh, two awls in my toolbox. Uh, basically, like I said, a sharpened screwdriver. Uh, one of mine I was handed down to be by my dad. I remember using it when I was a little kid, not for piercing ears. <laughs> Uh, but for starting holes in wood. And this all has a little a T handle on it, and there's a tiny bit of a spiral on the end just to help get holes started. I've got another one that's just uh, simply a, really a sharpened screwdriver, just a, a pointy metal thing on the uh, end of a little handle there. Uh, so you use it to get holes started, to put screws into, maybe so the wood doesn't split or something. And uh, no, it's also used, and all is used in leather work to get holes started and useful in other ways as well. It's, again, just a pointed metal object for poking stuff. 
uh, but here it is used to pierce an ear against a doorpost and this is something that a, a slave would volunteer for if he wanted to stay with his master from here on out. Well, let's continue tonight with Exodus 21, verses 7 through 11. The next paragraph here, Exodus 21, verses 7 through 11. If a man sells his daughter as a female slave, she is not to go free as the male slaves do. If she is displeasing in the eyes of her master who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He does not have authority to sell her to a foreign people because of his unfairness to her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. If he takes to himself another woman, he may not reduce her food, her clothing, or her conjugal rights. If he will not do these uh, three things for her, then she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. This is pretty messed up, I think, in our minds. I mean, we've already covered slavery, and now it just gets even more uh, sad, really. I mean, it hardly seems fair at all uh, by today's standards, but again, we need to remember God is regulating some pretty stubborn, disgusting human behavior. And the upside here is that we have one of the earliest records or references to redemption. And so the idea of buying something back, making a trade, making a swap, one thing for another of value. So if a female slave is displeasing in the eyes of her master, who apparently took her as a wife, uh, for himself. She isn't uh, just set free. He's not like, okay, get out of here. That's not what he does to this woman, but he must allow her, first of all, to be redeemed. He's got to give that option. And basically, we don't have all the, the information here. I think this is clarified later in scripture, but basically this gives this woman's own people a chance to buy her back. And so instead of just letting this woman be passed around, as I understand it, instead of sending her to some far off land where she would never see her family again, uh, those who actually love this woman have a chance uh, to make a trade and to purchase her freedom. Well, the man also has the option, though, of designating the woman for his son. And if that's the case, he must then start dealing with her not as a slave, but as a daughter. And so that relationship has to change if this is the path they choose. And then also we find that if the man takes another wife, in addition to this original slave who seems to be serving as something of a first wife, notice that he is specifically not allowed to treat her unfairly. He is not allowed to cut down on her food or her clothing, even her conjugal rights. And she, he is to treat her as fairly as possible, even if he takes in another woman. And so the reason is, it's not fair. You can't just ignore this woman. Uh, you took her, so she's yours. And you have a responsibility to care for this woman. And then if he refuses to treat her fairly, then she must be let go for nothing. And so it, it seems to me that it's in the master's best interest to treat his female slaves well. And again, it's not ideal. Uh, but God is regulating some very stubborn human behavior here, and this is uh, the way that he makes it as fair as possible under these circumstances. And again, even the concept of slavery is offensive to us these days. But we need to remember, I think this is quite a bit different from the slavery that we've experienced in the relatively recent past uh, here in this country. There are some huge differences. Well, let's continue with Exodus 21, verses 12 through 16. The next paragraph, Exodus 21, verses 12 through 16. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint you a place to which he may flee. If, however, a man acts presumptuously toward his neighbor so as to kill him craftily, you are to take him even from my altar that he may die. He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. Starting in verse 12, we have some regulations concerning various types of homicide, don't we? I think that would be the way we would describe it. In the Ten, Ten Commandments, remember the Lord simply said, you shall not murder. And you may remember I said there's some fine print coming later. This is part of that fine print. And so as we look at the fine print, as we look at some more detail here, I think we might say the rule is... If you strike a man so that he dies, the one who does the striking is to be put to death. That's the law. If you hit somebody so they die, you have to die. However, even in that commandment, we find an exception, don't we? 
how is this guy to be put to death without somebody putting him to death? In other words, even in this first sentence, right there in verse 12, even before we move beyond this at all, we find right here that not all killing is wrong. In fact, some killing was actually commanded by God under the law of Moses. So what I'm saying is, somebody had to carry this out. Somebody had to be the executioner. And in doing so, they were not in violation of the verse itself. Well, starting in verse 13, though, we have an exception beyond what's just built into this grammatically. Notice God recognizes that there may be some circumstances where one man may kill another without the intent of killing. Maybe by accident, for example. Again, not many details given here, but God sees a difference here. There's a difference between hiding behind a bush and jumping out and ambushing your neighbor with a big stick and on the other hand, maybe you chopping wood and the axe head flies off the handle and kills your neighbor two yards over. You know, one deserves the death penalty while the other does not. One of those is a tragic accident and one was premeditated. So God recognizes there is to be a difference in the consequences. But we also find in verse 13 that if a death is not premeditated, the one who does the killing is allowed to flee. And God will then set up these cities of refuge, kind of evenly spread out around the promised land once they, once they make it up there. So I see it almost like a, a game of tag that a lot of us used to play when we were kids. You know, if you uh, can make it back to the home base, then you're off limits. And so if you accidentally kill your neighbor, uh, what's the danger? What do, you, what do you do? Do you call 911, you know, in 1450 BC? Obviously that's not a, a possibility. You know, do you wait for the authorities? A lot of times it's going to be too long for them to get there before somebody takes care of this on, the, on their own. The danger is the man's family may run outside. They may be so upset that they rip you limb from limb right there on the front lawn. And I think God can see that coming. He's anticipating human behavior. And so under the law of Moses, though, you have the ability to make a run for it. So the instruction is if you accidentally kill your neighbor, you can flee to the nearest city of refuge and then you can let the judges handle it. So it's not spelled out in great detail here. We just have a little uh, little taste of it. But I think we have the beginnings of a judicial system. Somebody other than the two parties involved will end up deciding this case uh, once things have cooled down a little bit. Again, that's not all spelled out here. Uh, but a lot of people look at this, and we're going to get to uh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It's not a matter of my neighbor pokes my eye out, I can turn around and poke his out. Uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, but we need to have somebody judge this case and decide between us and uh, solve this in some kind of civilized way. Uh, however, notice in this passage, if the killing is indeed judged to be premeditated, then the killer is to be killed immediately. No exceptions. I mean, even if he's clinging to God's altar, begging for mercy. So as I understand it, this guy is praying to God. He's holding on to the altar. There will be no compromise here. There will be no imprisonment. There will be no extended trial. There will not be decades of appeals. But the death sentence, once it's decided, is to be carried out immediately. I was reading a week or two or three ago, I think about somebody executed in another state for a murder that happened. I thought it was back in 1993. That's the year we got married. That, that was 30 years ago. And I, I think that is not justice. So, I mean, the man is like 70, 80 years old now. 30 years has gone by. And uh, just a, a shocking delay in the judgment, uh, you know, the justice system today. Just a, a messed up system in some ways that, that we're under now. I mean, that's not justice at all. And I know this passage doesn't address our legal system today, of course. We're not saying, look... If somebody commits murder like this, they need to be executed within hours. That's not what's going on here. Uh, but I'm just noting the contrast. You know, back then, justice was to be carried out immediately. That's what I want to emphasize today, the, the uh, swiftness of justice under uh, the law of Moses. There, there was to be no delay. In verse 15, anyone who strikes his father or mother is to be put to death. I mean, that's all there is to it. That's extreme, I know. Very simple, though. God wanted children to honor their parents. I don't think we have a record of this being carried out, but this is the law. This is uh, the law of God on this issue. No striking of parents or the death penalty will result. In verse 16, God also demanded the death penalty for kidnapping. So these are the big ones. Murder, 
hitting your parents and kidnapping. And, uh, and reselling a hostage quickly was no defense. If you take hostages and then toss them or you know give them to somebody else, it didn't matter. So whether you had the victim with you, whether you already made the exchange, kidnapping was to result in the death penalty. And that's why I said earlier tonight that slavery back then seems to be different from what we read about in our own culture going back to the 16, 17, 1800s here in the U.S. You know, what happened here was kidnapping, wasn't it? People were taken from their native land. They were brought here uh, by force. They were not bought and sold willingly, uh, as we've discussed earlier in this chapter. So uh, what happened here was kidnapping. Uh, slavery under the law of Moses did not involve kidnapping. How do we know that? because the kidnapper would have been put to death and then the laws of slavery wouldn't have applied to those masters so it was a, a financial exchange a financial agreement that was made kidnapping was uh, punishable by death well let's continue with exodus 21 17 through 21 the next little chunk here exodus 21 17 through 21 he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death if men have a quarrel, and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die but remains in bed, if he gets up and walks around outside on his staff, then he who struck him shall go unpunished. He shall only pay for his loss of time, and shall take care of him until he is completely healed. If a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod, and he dies at his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, he survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken, for he is his property. Well, notice, according to verse 17, in addition to striking your father or mother, even cursing one's father or mother is to result in the death penalty. And it's interesting how he separates that, like, oh, and there's one more thing, kind of adding it on there. But I would take from that, our words are important, and especially what we say to our parents can be important. God feels very strongly about this under the law of Moses. And again, he's got to maintain societal structure. He's got to keep this nation together over the next 1,400 years to get his son to be born through these people. And I think that's part of it. Well, in verses 17 or uh, 18 and 19, uh, we've got a fight that results in an injury that is less than death. So if there's a fight that results in an injury that causes a lost time type injury, that's how I would summarize this. Um, uh, the punishment is to pay for the loss of time on the job. And then also the one who caused the injury is to take care of the victim until he's completely healed. And I had completely forgotten about this. I don't remember ever reading that before. I know I have. But imagine being forced to care for the person you injured. You know, today, this is not usually the way it happens, is it? Today, this is financial. This is a lawsuit or a judgment from the court. You've got to pay for their medical expenses. But back then, you actually had to be the nurse for the guy you punched in the face. And I don't know whether, you know, exactly what the reasoning is there. Maybe that would allow for the relationship to be restored. If I've now got to take off work for two weeks to nurse this guy back to health, I don't know. But I think that there is the uh, at least the possibility for a restoration of the uh, relationship here. Uh, maybe you've seen the pictures of two siblings being forced to wear the get-along shirt after a fight where they have to uh, live together in the same t-shirt for a little while. I'm thankful that my parents never did that to, uh, to me and my sister. Uh, but that's the picture that I have in my mind. Um, if you hurt somebody so they lose a couple weeks of work, you've got to take care of them until they're better. So that's kind of a burden on you, but it helps them at the same time. I'm also kind of thinking of, well, the Good Samaritan. He kind of did that even though he wasn't the one who caused the damage. But I think more specifically, I'm thinking of the Philippian jailer. We have no indication he was a Hebrew. He was not. He was a Roman jailer. But over in Acts chapter 16, remember, he washed the wounds on Paul and Silas that he had most likely inflicted on those two men. And that was his repentance. This man had a change of heart after he heard the gospel, and this change of heart resulted in some attempt to fix what he had done. He tried to make it right. I mean, he couldn't completely heal those wounds, obviously, but he recognized that it was wrong, and he did something to show he was uh, upset and tried to, uh, tried to fix what he'd done. In verse 20, if a slave is the victim, the aggressor, the owner, is punished, I would say, just as if the victim had been free. That would include the death penalty, I believe. Uh, but again, if it's a lost time type incident, there's no need to pay for the time because it's his own slave. So financially speaking, the owner has just injured himself, and uh, this is his punishment. He's missing out on the work that his own slave would have provided. 
Well, let's continue tonight with Exodus 21, verses 22 through uh, 24. It looks like 24 should be up there. So Exodus 21, starting in verse 22. If men struggle with, uh, with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now, some translations may refer to what happens here as a miscarriage. And I found notes that the New American Standard Bible uh, does that. And maybe that was an earlier version. I think I'm using the NASB tonight. At least I should be, but I don't see miscarriage uh, in the first part of this passage here. Um, but although some translate it in that way, that is not at all the most accurate translation. We actually have another word that is translated for miscarriage or abortion, killing a child before it's born, ripping child out of the womb. And that is not the word in Hebrew that's used here. This word, um, so that she gives birth prematurely, this is a word that's used to, to live births uh, several times in Scripture. So it uh, doesn't count uh, as, as a murder. Um, so anyway, some people have taken this and have looked at, you know, well, if there's a miscarriage, she pays a fine and made the conclusion that it's not life for life, therefore the baby wasn't really human, and, and kind of using this to justify abortion. That's not what's going on here. Uh, the word is translated accurately here as giving birth prematurely, yet there is no injury. So in other words, the child doesn't actually die um, in verse 22. However, if there is further injury, and that's outlined in verse 23, that is, if the child dies, then there is to be a penalty. So life for life, eye for eye, burn for burn, and so on. And I believe this is the first reference to an eye for an eye in Scripture. If I remember that correctly, I'd have to look that up again. You know, there was a general principle in the Old Testament that the punishment should fit the crime. And I know sometimes people see this as a minimum. If you poke my eye out, I have to poke your eye out. <laughs> um, but I would say, you know, although that could have some sense of truth to it, although we already discussed earlier tonight, it's not personal vengeance. This is going before judges to sort out. Um, you know, I would also point out that this is quite limiting. If you poke my eye, eye out, I may be mad enough to do who knows what to you. Does that make sense? So if you cut my ear off, I might not just cut your ear off, I might just do everything possible that I could do to you. Uh, but I think the summary here is the law of Moses would limit that kind of retaliation. So instead of looking at uh, the eye for an eye as something that must be done, and, and it should be done according to the law here, but I would also view it more as, um, as a limit. You know, if you poke my eye out, that's all that I can do to you. Not that I necessarily have to do that to you, uh, but I can't go killing people for some minor offense like that. So I hope that makes sense. Let me know if you have other thoughts on that. I'd love to hear that. But uh, let's continue with Exodus 21, 26 through 32. Exodus 21, uh, 26 through 32. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he shall let him go free on account of his eye. And if he knocks out a tooth of his male or female slave, he shall let him go free on account of his tooth. If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall surely be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall go unpunished. If, however, an ox was previously in the habit of goring, and his owner has been warned, yet he does not confine it, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. If a ransom is demanded of him, then he shall give for the redemption of his life whatever is demanded of him. Whether it gores a son or a daughter, it shall be done to him according to the same rule. If the ox gores a male or female slave, the owner shall give his or her master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Well, in verses 26 and 27, we get back to slavery. If a man destroys the eye of a slave, the slave gets to go free. Uh, so also, if he knocks out a slave's tooth, the slave is to be set free on account of the tooth. You know, what a strange provision of the law. We think, what in the world? It's kind of an interesting little tidbit here, uh, kind of a strange provision. But think of the effect that this would have on those who had slaves. You know, it would truly be in the master's best interest to care for his people, right? Knowing that this is in the law, 
I mean, it'd be a very bad move to be mistreating your slaves because you knew that if you beat them in a way that they lost a tooth or lost an eye, that you, you're at fault here, and the law has a provision for this. So I believe uh, that in this way, so also slavery wasn't ideal. God was at least protecting the slaves from abuse. In the rest of this passage, we've got some rules for those who own oxen. And this is an amazing passage here. It's simple, but it takes into account some history and what the owner should have known and uh, should have done based on what the ox had done before. If an ox gores someone to death for the very first time, put the ox to death. However, if the ox has been in the habit of doing this, well, that right there tells you the owner hasn't been following the law of Moses, has he? Because no ox should gore anybody twice. It would have been put to death the first time. So if it's in the habit of doing this, the owners ignore the law already. If the owner's been warned, does nothing to prevent this, then the ox and the owner are now to be put to death. And if the victim's family demands a ransom, the owner has to pay up no matter what the price tag might be. He's guilty. He has no defense. It is the death penalty, but if the family says, I'll take a million bucks instead, and you get to live, he's got to pay up, or else it is the death penalty. He should have known better. It's his fault as much as the oxen's fault at this point. And the same goes for if the ox gores a son or a daughter. But if the ox gores a slave, the owner of the ox is to give the owner of the slaves 30 pieces of silver, and then the ox must be put to death. Uh, by the way, where else do we read about 30 pieces of silver in Scripture? Wasn't that the price Judas got paid for betraying Jesus? Judas got the same reward as someone got for having their slave gored by an ox. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but just an uh, in interesting thing to note here. Uh, but uh, just as a general principle in this passage, one goring is an accident, the second goring is negligence, and carries with it a penalty that is much more severe. Well, let's conclude tonight with Exodus 21, verses 36, or 33 through 36. Exodus 21, 33 through 36. If a man opens a pit, or digs a pit, and does not cover it over, and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall give money to its owner, and the dead animal shall become his. If one man's ox hurts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide its price equally. And also they shall divide the dead ox. Or if it is known that the ox was previously in the habit of goring, yet its owner has not confined it, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall become his. Well, we basically continue this thought of uh, accident versus negligence, that discussion from the previous paragraph, only this time we're dealing with pits. And I'm thinking this would apply to other scenarios as well. It's not just talking about a pit here. I mean, I think the judges would be able to consider other situations and apply the law appropriately. Uh, but the example given here is someone digging a pit. If you dig a pit, then you probably need to realize with some common sense that uh, you've created a hazard. And if you don't cover it up and somebody's animal dies, you've got to pay for it. You've got to make restitution. Basically, you've bought yourself a dead animal. You broke it, you bought it. And I would kind of compare it today. If my neighbor comes over and says, hey, you've got a huge tree right on the property line that's leaning over my house and it looks rotten and I'm worried it's going to fall. And if they notify me of that in writing, I'm th I don't know how the law is, but I'm thinking that's not good for me to ignore that because I've been warned. And so there's this problem that I may need to deal with. Notice the rest of this deals with an ox goring not a person, but another animal. So kind of the way I look at that, these things happen. Um, so you sell the live ox and you divide up the proceeds of the one that uh, gets killed. On the other hand, um, if this ox has done this before, the owner should have known better. He gets to pay for the dead ox and then gets to keep it. So very kind of interesting. I might have misunderstood some of that there, but I think we get the point. And I know some of this may seem rather minute, but uh, we also need to remember these people are slaves themselves. Let's put that in perspective. These people were slaves at least three months ago. They, they were in Egypt building stuff, and here they are free. And they have absolutely no legal system whatsoever. And, you know, going forward in the wilderness over the next 40 years, stuff is going to happen. And I don't know whether we can even imagine the chaos that would follow if they didn't have some kind of law. You know, out there in the wilderness, if some guy digs a pit and somebody falls in and dies, the anger, the family revenge that follows would literally have the possibility, the potential of ripping the nation apart. I mean, that could throw them into a civil war that they may not be able to recover from. Or the other possibility is that they go back to Moses solving every single dispute. Remember that? 
back before Jethro, his father-in-law, came in. You know, and then the system gets clogged and, and they never make it to the promised land. And so it is, though, God is giving Moses this law in written form now, contributing to the stability of these people as a nation going forward. And this brings us to the end of Exodus 21. We've now started looking at some of the little details of the law of Moses. We hope to get back to this next week, I think, with some more information on property rights and then moving on from there. But thank you for being with us tonight. Again, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, let me know. If there's some way we can help, something we need to be praying about, if we can encourage you in some way, uh, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text. Give me a call at 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. But as we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we worship you tonight as the great lawgiver and judge. And we're thankful for your law and for your instruction. We know that you've taught us, you've warned us, you know what's best for us as our creator. And so we praise you for that. Even though we're living under a different law today, there's certainly so much that we can learn. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, and that we can run to him as our refuge, just as those ancient people were invited to flee to cities of refuge. We today flee to your son, Jesus. And so we come to you tonight in his name. Amen.